talking about the crowbar stuff i mean my first kind of interaction with crowbar was that first record that phil and selmo produced the one that like that first song high rate extinction it's like on my playlist that's such a badass riff how did that did did you guys have stuff before that was crowbar already kind of putting out albums before that and and how did that come about um how did how did you get to a point where you phil was like hey i'm gonna produce a record for you guys um we had a record prior to that album which is a self-titled that album is just called crowbar yeah so we call it the self-titled record which this year 2023 was well, almost over but was the 30th anniversary of the release of the record um but so we put out, yeah yes so we put out a record called obedience through suffering in 91 and uh it was on a smaller label uh still affiliated it was on grindcore uh which Mark Noir from that label kind of started Pavement. We were really one of the first bands to, to be on Pavement. And, um, you know, uh, as far as Phil getting involved, he was a big fan of the band from the very, very get-go, even before we were Crowbar and we were called the, the Slugs. Um, he had the demo. You know, I had sent him on or brought it to Texas or something when he was in uh, – had just joined, you know, not long after he joined Pantera, not just joined Pantera, but I think we did our demo at the beginning of 1990. So we were writing the stuff, and at, by the end of 89, really, what would end up being becoming Crowbar. Um, but, you know, uh, I think I just asked Phil, like, you know, dude, would you mind, do you want to uh, produce this record, you know? And um, because by that time, he had already done cowboys and uh vulgar display of power so he had you know with terry date producing plus i mean even when they were doing you know power metal and then phil came in and redid vocals or whatever when he had first joined the band you know vinnie paul was and and dime and rex for that matter had so much more experience in a real studio since they were really young uh just their dad was a musician wasn't he exactly and had a studio so yeah. you know they, they were so much so far ahead of us as far as knowledge of of how to you know just what to do how to make a fucking record so you know phil even said he goes look i'm not much of a tone guy y'all have a your own sound let's just capture what y'all sound like and uh but he was very very uh involved with the songwriting and the arrangement and really taught taught me to this day i think of a lot of little pointers that he gave me here and there like i remember the first time we played the song that would turn into existence as punishment and he's just kind of doing his field thing and he's watching he's checking shit out and this and that and at the end he's like all right you want my honest opinion i'm like yeah he goes what do y'all got four or five riffs in that song or something i'm like it's something like that he goes you got one good riff, the rest is garbage. It sounds like you just glued riffs together. Like he wrote one, he wrote, you know, he goes, let's let's start with this particular riff, which is the opening riff of the song. And he said, do y'all have any songs that begin with bass? I'm like, no, he goes, why don't you start it with the bass? And it's it turned into being basically a two riff song is all it really is. Just layering, you know, building with harmony guitars and going back to just chords. And whatnot but uh it showed me that you can write a great song with only two riffs you know um uh, two or three riffs and even a song a crowbar song like planets collide essentially other than a bridge um is basically one riff that just changes as the song keeps going on you know so uh you know that that at that time in my life that early on um as a songwriter and then you know recording the record you know phil was a huge uh, huge influence and um really just a huge help in in showing all of us how you know like he just use using what he had learned from working with terry date and working with you know world-class caliber musicians with don vinnie and rex and um you know which were all so many levels above what we were we were still just fucking you know riding in a van fucking basically our first record obedience and suffering was to me was a glorified demo you know it sounds like shit you know but um 
And that, we, we, we were still in a transitional period with, with Crowbar during that first record. There were still parts that were kind of thrashy and, and things that I wouldn't really do with Crowbar now. Uh, with the self-title, that's why we just, I told the guys, I said, look, let's just call a thing Crowbar. Because the first record is not really a great, uh, I guess, you know, uh, example of what we really sound like. Now we found our sound. You know, it was still a bit experimental, still developing, you know, uh, dropping certain elements of our sound and bringing in other elements of our sound at that at, at that point in time. So, uh, you know, Phil coming in and, and kind of arranging and even helping me, and I still do it to this day, which can be a good or a bad thing, but I was freaking out. I'm like, well, man, I'm supposed to sing a song tomorrow. You know, I'm on the phone with him and I'm like, I don't have any fucking lyrics. He's like, we'll get it. And I'm like, but I don't have any lyrics. He's like, ah. So he kind of helped me a lot and showed me like Big Todd would drive. I think he had, what did he have? A fucking Monte Carlo. And me and Phil would sit in the back seat with the notebook and listen to like a tape of the music. And we, you know, I'd start something and he'd, you know, he'd help me along with it. And I still, to this day, I think Crowbar is 126 songs. And uh, I, even on my solo record, and now I just completed my second solo record. Still to this day, I'll write lyrics on the spot or like the morning I got to sing them or whatever. It's, and I really enjoy the spontaneity of doing it that way. Like I'll go back and listen to it and say, no, this word doesn't fit or this line's cheesy or whatever. But I'm more with the whole songwriting thing where I don't, I hate to say I don't think too much because it sounds like you're not taking it serious or you're not, you know, you're not having a professional approach. But the more you think about it, the the worse it gets. It's like the, yeah. the emotion of it and the feeling of the first thing you get is usually, usually right. Like, like being with with the typo guys, you know, they, their joke is always that, you know, Peter Steele would always be like, the possibility possibilities are endless and they are, but Kenny's like, so, you know, we do all this shit. And most of the time we'd end up right back to square one with the original idea. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I'm, we've, we've even developed with, I am now, which I love and down has always done it this way where everything's not mapped out and planned out. We get in a room together and bounce ideas off one another and, you know, great things happen. And and I am has developed into being able to do that now where we show up at get together 10, 30, 11 in the morning in the studio and by 5, 30, 6 o'clock, Johnny's tracking drums, you know, songs written, that's great. arranged, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's a great, great feeling. And that's when you know that the chemistry is there. You know, I mean, they're great guys, obviously, obviously Big Todd is a, you know, is, a, you know, one of my dearest, very old friends um uh so you know that that that's a given you know but uh to, to have kenny and johnny uh to really have chemistry with them as well and we do it's great it's a great uh great thing <laughs>